Throughout the 18th century, Great Britain experienced economic, industrial, and social revolution as had never been seen before. It invented new means of production, new machines, and a new class of workers to serve these machines and their owners. Exploited, underpaid, deprived of the freedom of association, the right to strike, and the right to vote, hundreds of thousands of these women and men possessed nothing but the strength of their arms and the desire to be fully recognized as human beings. The Fields of Waterloo in Belgium. In 1815, it was here that Great Britain and its allies triumphed over the empire of Napoleon. Great Britain was at this time the world's leading industrial power, and Belgium was its European bridgehead. As a symbol of this partnership, crowning this pyramid is a 26-ton cast iron lion, produced in a Belgian steelworks founded by an Englishman in Serain, near Liège. At the beginning of the 19th century, Belgium was the only European country to unreservedly adopt the English model. The two countries had economic liberalism in common, which favored the development of large enterprises employing several thousand workers, which in France and Germany was still extremely rare. So it was that in a few decades, Belgium became the world's second largest economic power, just behind England. It was said that Belgium was a paradise for capitalists and a hell for workers. Serin Steelworks in 1840. The same steelworks a century and a half later, filmed by Jean-Claude Riga in the 1980s. The steelworks closed in 1990. All that remains today of one of Europe's largest factories is this rusting carcass which no one knows what to do with, and the memories of former workers. Au fourneau, c'est vivant. Vous chargez de la matière par le par le dessus. La matière descend dans le haut fourneau. Il y a toutes sortes de réactions avec les gaz qui se font. Et en dessous, ben, la matière sort bien ou elle ne sort pas bien. Et donc, des fois, ben, la température idéale, c'est 1480 degrés. Mais des fois, ben, on chutait en dessous des, des 1400 degrés. Donc, euh, alors là, les matières ne s'écoulaient pas bien. Quoi. Et c'est là que les journées étaient les plus difficiles. Oui, je me rappelle bien une fois quand tu étais venu à Kessal, parce qu'il était transféré sur Kessal dans le froid. Il m'avait un peu expliqué son métier et tout ça, quand tu m'avais fait un peu une caricature du, du haut fourneau, en me disant « c'était un estomac, c'est comme un estomac ouais. ». <rire> tu l'écoutais au bruit, et ouais, faut pas mal. Il fallait toujours être attentif au moindre bruit. Dès qu'il y avait un bruit suspect, il fallait euh, tout de suite réagir, quoi, parce que ça pouvait tout de suite tourner à la catastrophe. Quoi, hein. On ne riait pas tous les jours, mais c'est là que j'ai les meilleurs souvenirs. Hein. Mais le chaud, c'est pas le froid. Le chaud, c'est beaucoup plus familial. Il y a quelque chose dans le chaud qui... Enfin, moi, pour avoir fait les deux, chaud et froid, le, le chaud, il n'y a rien à faire. C'est plus cher. De, demain, on relance. Vous pouvez demander aux travailleurs que travaillent dans le chaud. Ils courent, ils courent pour aller travailler dans le chaud pour relancer les outils. La plupart des gens, c'est beaucoup plus chaleureux. Je ne sais pas, c'est plus familial. Pourtant, il y a toujours eu des tensions aussi. Hein. Ce n'est pas que tout était rose dans le chaud, loin de là. Mais avec quelque chose, une entraide qui était différente. On, tra on travaillait plus en ensemble, je trouve. Mais c'est vrai que dans le froid, ben, on doit peut-être tout le temps attentif au ouais, défilement de la bande. Euh, voilà, c'est très différent. différent. Ouais. Les gens sont un peu plus isolés, ils sont dans ouais, des cabines. Oui. 
Voilà. Et qui avait ouais. sur la ligne, tandis que bon, nous, on était... Euh... On devait travailler ensemble. On devait travailler ensemble. Et après, maintenant, ben, la de, le dernier plan de restructuration de M. Mittal, ben, on, était, on était en cours de trop, donc euh, il a fallu euh, licencier du personnel. Donc voilà, ça a été, ça a été la porte. Après 30 ans de, de chirurgie. Et maintenant Ah ben maintenant, j'ai retrouvé du travail, je suis reconverti dans le, la logistique et le transport. Voilà, 53 ans, c'est pas mal. Parce que bon, il y a déjà beaucoup de jeunes qui ne trouvent pas de travail. Donc voilà, je peux m'estimer heureux. Quoi. Back to the past. Work is at the same company in 1886. They can't speak, so we don't know what they're thinking, but none of them are smiling. We see the weariness of age, the weariness of children, apprentices, and that of an old man who has no other choice but to keep working because there is no retirement for workers. 20 years earlier still, 1868, workers at the same foundry. An extraordinary portrait gallery dreamt up by the directors to show off the company's wealth in terms of human material. The workers strike poses in a studio with the tools of their trade. The images show us what they do, but not how they live. They lived crammed into the new slums of the industrial cities, like those in Glasgow, unhealthy ghettos, hidden from the eyes of the happiest classes, sometimes a single street away. Dilapidated houses rented out for fortunes by unscrupulous landlords. The exploitation came full circle. Historian Stefan Berger. Some of the housing was built by the employers. Uh, some of the housing was built privately, but usually the idea was to cram as many workers uh, into a house as possible and therefore also to follow the new capitalist logic of making profit from housing. Um, and of course it also meant in many cases a new diet. It was not any longer a diet determined by agriculture and by what was available through agriculture, but the wages allowed the new workers to buy food that then would be consumed. But it was often a very poor diet. And uh, I've got one example here from the economist Friedrich List, who observed in the middle of the 19th century what the diet of poorer families in the German lands looked like. And uh, he wrote, and I quote, Potatoes without salt, very thin soup with black bread, porridge, every now and again black dumplings. Those who are better off can afford a modest piece of fresh or smoked meat once a week, yet most know the term roast only from hearsay. I have seen quarters in which it was quite usual to hang a herring fixed to the ceiling with a piece of string just above the table. Everyone at the table could rub his or her potato against the herring so as to give aroma to the potatoes." End of quote. The misery of the English workers around 1830 was so deep that they compared their lot to that of the black slaves of the colonies. In 1833, when the English Parliament abolished slavery, some went so far as to protest that the first to be liberated should be the white slaves, as they refer to themselves. But change was on the horizon. The worker population of the main cities had become so vast that they could no longer be ignored. Exploited, hungry, unhappy and unknown, they struck fear. One French journalist wrote, 
The barbarians who threaten us today are not in the Caucasus nor in the steppes of Tartary. They are on the outskirts of our industrial cities. Modern society will perish at the hands of the proletariat. This was not just a figure of speech. The upper classes were directly threatened by the epidemics which broke out in the slums of the major cities and against which social barriers were powerless. Diphtheria, scrofula, cholera, the monstrous children of the Industrial Revolution. In England, militant newspapers like The Poor Man's Guardian publicly denounced the living conditions of workers, while throughout industrial Europe, parliamentary commissions debated what had become known as the social question. Good society could not carry on as if it were unaware. But for them, it wasn't the fault of the system, but that of the workers. Each had their own remedy. Workers would feel better if they went to church more often. If they drank less. Or even as the philosopher Malthus put it, if they had less children, to thin out the available workforce on the market and thereby obtain better salaries. English reformers initially took a pragmatic approach by attacking child labor, as denounced by Charles Dickens in his 1837 novel, Oliver Twist. At the time, tens of thousands of children carried out subservient work in textile mills and mines. Under the liberal doctrine, it was forbidden for the state to interfere in the working relationship between workers and bosses, which was considered an agreement freely entered into by two equal partners. When it came to children, this argument collapsed. In 1842, despite fierce opposition from employers, Parliament prohibited the employment of children under the age of 10 in underground galleries, a victory partially due to Victorian prudery because the heat in the mines obliged adults and children to work almost naked. At the same period, Great Britain, with its habitual advance over the rest of Europe, was the first country to legalize workers' unions, even though strikes remained forbidden. Priority was given to political action. In 1832, reformers and workers' representatives signed a charter, demanding universal suffrage and a democratization of Parliament. As a practical lesson in democracy, the charter was accompanied by an outline for secret ballot polling stations. Chartist petitions gathered millions of signatures. Meetings attracted hundreds of thousands of protesters. It was a mass movement, reflecting the scale of the industry within which it was born and at the origin of the accepted image of the working class this compact, homogeneous, and apparently unstoppable crowd. But throughout the 19th century, this image was true for England and Belgium alone. Apart from one or two exceptions, France had no large factories. Its industry was based on a dense network of small companies comprising a few dozen workers at most. This system was for a long time considered as craft industry, as though only large-scale industry was capable of producing authentic workers. An argument refuted by the philosopher Jacques Ranciere. Les gens de ma génération euh, ont vécu avec l'idée de la classe ouvrière comme une espèce de, bah, de réalité massive. Quoi. Il, y avait les, il y avait les masses de gens qui sortaient des usines, il y avait un syndicalisme euh, qui était fort, il y avait ces masses ouvrières qu'on qu voyait défiler. Donc on avait une espèce de vision globale qui était euh, bon, autour de, autour de l'usine. Autour de l'usine et comme une espèce de réalité, euh, de réalité stable. Euh, or, euh, par rapport à ça, bon, les gens disaient, mais, voilà, mais avant la classe ouvrière, il y a quelque chose qui est différent, c'est l'artisanat... Euh, euh, 
bon, par conséquent, moi, quand j'ai commencé à travailler sur les années 1830, on m'a dit, mais c'est pas des vrais ouvriers, parce que pour les gens, les vrais ouvriers, c'est les, c'est les gens qui travaillent à l'usine, euh, c'est les gens qui travaillent, ceux qui travaillent à la chaîne. C'était un peu comme ça qu'on pensait les choses. Alors bon, par rapport à ça, bien sûr, j'ai essayé de, de changer la perspective, de dire, mais la classe ouvrière, bon, ça n'existe ça pas, ça n'existe pas en soi. Alors, on peut toujours le définir comme réalité sociologique, mais la classe ouvrière, c'est, qu'elle, c'est, c'est une réalité qui est aussi une réalité symbolique. C'est-à-dire, pour qu'il y ait classe ouvrière, pour qu'il y ait mouvement ouvrier, il faut qu'il y ait des gens qui, euh, à un certain moment, justement, sortent de leurs simples conditions d'ouvrier au sens euh, bah, où des gens qui sont payés pour faire un travail, qui le font, et puis ils rentrent chez eux, et puis ils recommencent le lendemain. Quoi. Si on regarde euh, un petit peu euh, d'où viennent les gens qui sont ouvriers au 19e siècle, bon, bah, ils, viennent de, ils viennent de régions très très différentes, ils ont des trajets très très différents, et bon, ils vivent un peu euh, souvent euh, cette condition comme une condition qui est une condition, euh, une condition transitoire. Euh, bon, euh, je cite quelque part, euh, je pense, cette les propos de cet ouvrier Saint-Simonien qui raconte un peu tous tout, tout les métiers qu'il a fait, les métiers les plus divers, et qui, donc il énumère ses métiers et en disant « et toujours dans une autre attente ». Voilà, bon, j'ai, j'ai essayé de, de commenter cette autre attente. Savoir que la classe ouvrière est inventée par des gens qui sont dans une autre attente. However, it was this mixed and volatile French worker environment that the most radical utopias of the 19th century were born and raised. This was the dream of Fourier where one would only work according to one's desires, and where marriage and family would be replaced by a new, loving world governed by the laws of attraction. And this, less amusing, was the dream of Cabet, inventor of the word communism, who considered Fourier completely immoral. Cabet advocated an ideal community of workers, where everything was shared, except the women, and where equality reigned in abundance. Here we find LaRue and his religious philosophy of progress, which rejected egalitarianism and communism and demanded respect for private property. Here, Proudhon, for whom on the contrary, property was theft, and who wanted to peacefully establish a mutualist democracy. and Blanqui, the perpetual rebel, who was to be for all the workers' revolutions of the century, a partisan of clandestine action and revolutionary coup. His last secret society bore the poetic name of the Society of the Seasons. Saint-Simon, on the other hand, wanted an end to revolutions and to replace the exploitation of man by man with the fraternal sharing of the benefits of progress in large-scale industry. Workers gazed quite sympathetically upon this utopia market, the promoters of which were mainly members of the bourgeoisie, who were at odds with their own class. But they had no desire to get mixed up in adventurous enterprises such as the Icaria, the libertarian community founded in America by Etienne Cabet, for which he only managed to recruit about 100 men and women. A utopia quickly undermined by conflict, but which nonetheless managed to survive until the end of the 19th century. More popular than the dreams of utopians was a new literary form which appeared in France in the 1830s, working-class poetry, such as that of the shoemaker Savinien Lapointe. These working-class poets, who worked by day and wrote by night, chose to express themselves in the noble tongue of bourgeois writers. The Misery of the Worker, chanted in Alexandrine verse. The concept might provoke a smile, but workers related to it, as with this song by Pierre Dupont, which was referred to at the time as the Marseillaise of the Workers. Nous dont la lampe le matin au clair on du coq se rallume. Nous tous qu'un salaire incertain ramène avant l'auba l'enclume. Nous qui des bras, des pieds, des mains, de tout le corps luttons sans cesse. Sans abriter nos lendemains contre le froid de la vieillesse. Quels fruits tirons-nous des labeurs qui courbent nos maigres échines Où vont les flots de nos sueurs Nous ne sommes que des machines. 
The insistence of this recurrent we is the growing awareness of a common identity, despite the disparity of standing in professions. Outside the workplace, this became apparent in the clothing which was worn. The blouse, which was common in France in the middle of the 19th century, designated the worker. The suit designated the bourgeois. Blouses were often worn with the sleeves rolled up because the workers showed what they had to sell, their strength. The bourgeoisie, on the other hand, were always covered from head to foot when in public. Until the middle of the 19th century, access to the Tuileries Gardens was forbidden to those in blouses and exclusively reserved for those in suits. But with developments in the textile industry reducing the cost of clothing, workers in their Sunday best could look like the bourgeoisie when there was a holiday. As a reaction to this, the young bourgeoisie began to venture out disheveled and unshaven. On the other hand, if workers started wearing their blouses even on a Sunday by means of affirming their identity, any perspicacious police commissioner might see it as a sign of seditious intent. But the notion of wearing work clothes in order to affirm one's class identity was typically French. A worker in London would have been ashamed to go out in public without wearing clothes similar to those of his employer. However, one point in which English and French workers had in common was a certain resistance to work dating back to the 18th century. Saint Monday was an extra day of rest which they afforded themselves without asking for anyone's permission. This custom, also prevalent in Germany under the name of Blue Monday, was the subject of comic illustrations. Here a wife punishes her lazy, drunken husband. And here workers take advantage of the rest day to beat up the bourgeoisie. This underlines the subversive nature of this anomaly in the industrial new order, which carried through into the early 20th century. The factory owners were very keen in implementing order in the factories. So the new factory regimes had a very tight time schedule. Everything had to work according to the rhythm of the machines. So everything in the factory was timed. From the beginning of work to the end of work, breaks had to be timed. Uh, even if you wanted to go to the toilet, this had to be timed, and it was strictly controlled. If we think about a company like Krupp, already in the middle of the 19th century, they actually employed people to control how long workers spent in the toilet. So the workers tried in many little ways to undermine the new rhythm of the factory, to stay at the toilet for longer, to not start work on time, uh, to try and have some kind of sneak little breaks in the middle of the work, even sometimes to sabotage the machines in order to stop the rhythm of the factory. So there were many different ways in which workers were trying to have their own rhythm against the rhythm of the machine, against the rhythm of the factory. Gislain Tormos, a worker in the car industry. Les gars attendent régulièrement une panne. Parce que la panne, c'est... C'est là que je souffle. J'en ai même qui font des gris-gris sur la ligne pour, euh, pour dire il faut que tu tombes en panne à un moment donné, il faut, faut que ça s'arrête. Tellement les gens en ont ras le pompon. Quoi. Parce que bah, quand une chaîne ne s'arrête pas, euh, c'est trois heures consécutives avant d'attendre 20 minutes de pause. C'est long, hein c'est long. Entre la fatigue, entre vous avez soif, vous avez faim, euh, euh, le café, le café qui est indispensable. Euh, bah maintenant, on n'a même plus le droit d'aller boire un café. C'est deux minutes euh, réglementaires. Euh, et si tu veux y aller une deuxième fois, il faut demander à ta hiérarchie. Donc si elle refuse, euh, tu restes en poste. C'est pareil pour aller euh, uriner. Ils ont institué que bah, ce serait que deux minutes pour aller aux toilettes. 
et une seule fois. C'est limite si on leur dit pas éduquer votre vessie, quoi. C'est ça. Donc ils, sont, ils en sont là. Ça, c'est nouveau quand même. Ça fait, bon, ça fait quoi Même pas. Peut-être huit mois que c'est sorti. Ça, c'est le directeur du site qui a décrété que. C'est. Alors je sais pas comment il fait lui dans son bureau, je sais pas. Unlike English workers who were mainly legalist, French workers in the 19th century willingly participated in uprisings. Their favorite weapon was the barricade, which was a reflection of themselves. Spontaneous, urban, made up of whatever was available. Between 1830 and 1871, Paris witnessed three large popular uprisings. The first broke out in July 1830. The workers formed an alliance with the Republican middle class to overthrow the authoritarian regime of Charles X. But after this, when they demanded social reform, they were snubbed by the Republican authorities, who called them irresponsible children. Jumping forwards in time, a century and a half later, one of the leaders of the Czechoslovakian Communist Party remonstrated with workers from a factory in Prague who were striking to obtain democratization of the regime. J'ai plusieurs fois commenté ce, ce texte de 1829 d'un écrivain français, Balanche, qui réécrit la, euh, la sécession des plébéiens romains sur l'Aventin. Où, où ce qui devient important, ce n'est pas le fait que les, euh, les plébéiens ont des revendications, c'est le fait qu'ils veulent être entendus comme des êtres parlants. Et pour les patriciens, bien sûr, c'est impensable, parce que pour eux, les plébéiens, c'est des espèces d'animaux, de, de, bon, ils peuvent éventuellement grogner, mais qui ne parlent pas. Et les plébéiens ont à prouver qu'ils parlent. Ils font donc toute une série d'actes symboliques pour montrer, pour montrer qu'ils sont des êtres parlants. Quoi. Or, c'est un, bon, un texte qui a eu, qui a eu beaucoup d'influence à l'époque et qui, vraiment, véritablement, on peut dire, correspond très, 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 très fort à ce que, les gens, ce que les gens ressentent, ce que les gens ressentent en 1830 sur le pavé parisien, qui ressentent en 1831 lors des insurrections lyonnaises, qui ressentent dans, 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 tout, dans toute cette période, quoi. À savoir que, euh, désormais, ils, ils veulent être entendus comme des êtres parlants, comme des êtres qui, eux aussi, ont, on peut dire, une, au fond, une capacité de penser les, les choses de la communauté et d'instituer. Euh, comme une espèce de, de discussion euh, sur cette communauté. During the three days of the 1830 revolution, classes and symbols intertwined. In the famous painting by Delacroix, the urchin wears a middle class waistcoat, and the bourgeois the trousers of a worker. As for the blouse wearing worker, he appears to be waiting for Marianne to accord him justice. But once the political revolution was won, the bourgeoisie imposed the return to order. The powerless workers had to renounce the social revolution. Eighteen years later, in February 1848, the same scenario was played out once more. The middle class and workers, having once again become allies, overthrew the monarchy of Louis Philippe and proclaimed the republic. To occupy and feed workers during the deep economic crisis caused by the revolution, the Republican government created a system of public works, national workshops. But in June, considering that these were hotbeds of unrest, they decided to close them down, and the desperate and starving workers took up arms once more. And for the very first time, photographs show a workers' uprising. It was June 26, 1848, and at the moment this picture was taken, the defenders of this barricade on the Rue du Faubourg du Temple were unaware that the uprising had failed and that they were amongst the last resistance. 
A second picture, taken early the next morning, shows the street after the army's assault. The soldiers finished off the wounded, shot the prisoners, and sometimes also the inhabitants of neighboring houses. There were 3,000 dead, thousands condemned to hard labor or deportation to Algeria. A heavy price to pay for the failure of a spontaneous revolt without leaders or strategy. The barricades of the days of June 1848 were like these haphazardly thrown stones. Spontaneous, set up to defend the street and neighborhood, uncoordinated, with neither goal nor strategy. They only lasted three days. In 1871, the Paris Commune learnt lessons from previous failures. Contrary to the impression given by the 1920 Soviet filmmaker, who got a little carried away with revolutionary fervor, the barricades of the Paris Commune were neat, thought out on a citywide scale, and supervised by a barricades commission, by whom the construction of wildcat barricades was forbidden. This military discipline is understandable, considering that the Commune had many soldiers in its ranks. It was born out of the 1870 war against Prussia and the French defeat which brought about the fall of the Second Empire. Refusing the terms of the armistice, which demanded that Paris give up its cannons, the Parisians kept them and chased off the new Republican government, which fled to Versailles. During the 72 days of its existence, the Commune indulged in some spectacular events, like the adoption of the red flag and the destruction of the Vendôme Column, a symbol of the overthrown empire. Just as symbolic were the dozens of decrees which the Commune made, despite being under siege from the governmental army and knowing full well that it would never have the time to implement them. A decree about rent remission, a decree about the separation of the church from state, a decree about free schooling and scholastic supplies, about the suppression of night work for bakery workers, about the Natural History Museum, about the creation of a workers' union chamber, about a new market on the Place Monge, about the organization of a great concert in aid of the wounded and prisoners on Thursday, May 25th, when the troops of Versailles were in the process of taking back the city. The Commune was crushed in one blood-stained week, the Semaine Sanglante, at the cost of 7,000 dead. After the massacres came the insults. In this series of stereoscopic images entitled Le Sabbat Rouge, the Commune is depicted as an orgy of infernal demons, sorcerers, and witches. A few years later, the Third Republic permitted the vanquished to celebrate their defeat at the Communard's Wall at the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery, against which the last of the Commune fighters had faced the firing squad. But even these stones would not be spared. In 1880, the bullet-marked stones were taken down and reassembled at the other end of the cemetery, to serve as a support for a sculpture to the memory of victims of revolutions without distinction, a convenient way of jumbling up oppressed and oppressors together. Quand nous chanterons le temps des cerises et guerre au signal et mer le moqueur seront tous en fait les belles aurons la folie en tête et les amoureux du soleil au cœur. As the last great revolution of the 19th century, the Paris Commune marked a turning point in the history of the workers' struggle. The memory of it was to be celebrated as much by the great totalitarian regimes as by simple militants. Communaro Tobia, a worker from Terni. Sono gli ultimi di sette figli, 
forse è importante chiamarli per nome tutti che sono di per sé stessi una storia ribelle vera spirita nuova true spirit, spirit. vero spirito nuovo libero avanti libero avanti pensiero pensiero ideale ideale vero e comunale e che il mio primo fratello fu battezzato sotto la bandiera rossa nel 1904 compare da eh, Urbinati una specie di cerimonia il segretario di sezione avviava alla vita questo ragazzino con la bandiera presenza della bandiera non è che facevano le cerimonie ok l'augurio una bottiglia di, di spumante o di, o di vino o di eccetera c'è qualcosa eh, nella cultura nella cultura proprio di queste parti dell'Italia centrale che era sotto il dominio della Chiesa di eh, reagire al dominio della Chiesa inventandosi una ritualità alternativa e una, eh, e una nominazione alternativa dei figli. I figli qui si chiamano ribelle, eh, ideale, comunardo. No? Stiamo parlando di fine, otto, fine 800 e inizio 900. L'altra cosa che a me era importante con i nomi è che quando noi parliamo di proletari, la parola proletario significa qualcuno la cui unica proprietà sono i figli. E allora la nominazione dei figli è un atto di eh, autonomia eh, che è l'unico atto di autonomia che è possibile a chi non ha altri che i figli. E, e infatti in tutta questa parte laica dell'Italia centrale, Emilia, Toscana, Marche, Umbria, eh, questo dare dei nomi alternativi ai figli eh, è, è comunissimo, a Terni ci sono persone che si chiamano non necessariamente politici, anche nomi di fantasia, Agramante, Orneore, no? No, semplicemente il piacere del suono. No? E quindi c'è questa idea di una cultura eh, operaia, in, in un certo senso anche pre-socialista. In these alternative rituals, festivals have an important place. The anniversary of the Paris Commune is celebrated, And above all, the 1st of May is proclaimed International Workers' Day in 1890. Throughout Europe, the 1st of May became a day of workers' protests, which were forbidden and violently suppressed, like it for me in 1891, when the army fired on protesters, killing nine of them. In Italy, people took to the streets singing the hymn of the 1st of May to the tune of Verdi's Nabucco. Other, less passive songs celebrated the struggle of the great revolts, like that of the weavers of Lyon in 1832, who fought the army on the streets of the Quarus to the cry of live working or die fighting, an uprising immortalized by the famous Chant de Canoux. Notre règne arrivera quand votre règne finira. Notre règne arrivera quand votre règne finira. Nous tisserons le linceul du vieux monde, car on entend déjà la révolte qui gronde. C'est nous les canuts, nous n'irons plus nus. But in reality, this song was composed 60 years later by the anarchist songwriter Aristide Brouon, taking inspiration from a poem by Heinrich Hein, dating back to 1844 and celebrating a different revolt, that of the German weavers of Silesia. This was another revolt in desperation caused by famine, spontaneous and disorganized, suppressed by the army after three days of demands and looting. 
However, this revolt, reconstructed here in the 1920s German film The Weavers, had its own song, composed by the Weavers themselves, Le Blutgericht, the Tribunal of Blood, a song in the form of a sermon, referring to the exploiters as mischievous demons and sons of Satan. Two revolts, three songs, which became intermingled over the years in the twists and turns of workers' memories. And as if this wasn't enough, here is something written at the time by a young German exile taking refuge in London. Not one of the workers' uprisings in France or England has been of such theoretical or knowledgeable character as that of the weavers of Silesia. Signed, Karl Marx. When he wrote these lines, Karl Marx was still just a young German revolutionary living in exile in London. But the theories which he elaborated in the following years were to throw their shadow over working class history as a whole for the century to come. Criticizing the utopian socialism of his rivals, Marx advocated a rigorous and scientific socialism, which would make the class struggle the driving force behind human history. This struggle was to set up the bourgeoisie, owners of the means of production, in opposition to the proletariat, which owns nothing but its workforce. His analysis concludes by an act of faith in the redemptive mission of the working class. Having nothing to lose, it was the only class capable of freeing society as a whole and abolishing the very notion of class. The revolutionary process was inevitable. Capitalism was condemned to disappear, undermined by its internal contradictions. The theories of Karl Marx, developed in the Communist Manifesto of 1848, spread thanks to the International Working Men's Association, which he founded with other European socialists and anarchists in 1864. However, Marx himself was nearly refused membership. The French section considering that only manual workers were true workers. After bitter debate, a compromise was reached, letting each national section decide if it also accepted international workers and women. From 1870, Marx rejoiced in the victories of the Prussian army over France. They underlined the new status of Germany, an essentially rural country, which in the space of 20 years had become an industrial superpower. An example of this metamorphosis were the Krupp factories which produced the cannons which had bombarded Paris. For Marx, the new German proletariat was theoretically superior to any other. It was therefore with pleasure that he wrote of the envisaged move of the center of gravity of the European social movement from France to Germany. After the defeat of France and the failure of the Commune, the facts seemed to agree with him. In 1875, the Social Democratic Party of Germany was founded, which became the first mass workers' party, numbering up to one million members, the prototype of the great parties of the 20th century. In 1880, the party adopted Marxism as its official doctrine, drawing a paradoxical conclusion from it. Since the collapse of capitalism was inevitable, there was no need for a revolution. It was just a question of waiting. And in the meantime, in order to be ready when the moment came, workers owed it to themselves to become respectable and to adopt the habits and tastes of the petty bourgeoisie, even in their worst excesses. The ideas of the working class that are championed by social democracy uh, also work very much with the differentiation of different parts of the working class. So you have, the, the, at the highest level, uh, the class-conscious proletariat, um, the 
person who is a member of the German Social Democratic Party, who has joined a social democratic trade union, who is a member in a social democratic uh, consumers cooperative, who is maybe a member of the local social democratic cycling club, and who spends his time educating himself, um, being more knowledgeable, uh, and working towards the overcoming of capitalism. And then you have uh, various uh, forms of working class existences, if you like, below that highest form of working class existence. And at the very bottom, you have the so-called lumpen proletariat. So the people who drink, who gamble, uh, who beat their wives, uh, who uh, don't give a damn about how their children are educated, and who, if you like, are um, betraying the mission of their own class in the eyes of German social democracy. Lumpen proletariat, the proletariat in rags, as seen in all its metaphorical and caricatural richness by the 1920s Russian filmmaker Eisenstein. The word and what it represents are the invention of Karl Marx, a new social category of his creation to explain the failings of workers' revolutions betrayed by this underclass. The sparkless, displaced rabble, as he put it. Always ready to sell themselves to the bourgeoisie to sabotage the endeavors of conscious workers. For German social democracy, this also had the advantage of rendering the worker respectable. The unfortunate underclass was the unique heir to all the faults which the 19th century bourgeoisie had attributed to the working class as a whole. A more complex image of the German working class was revealed by an astonishing sociological study carried out by a dissident social democrat in 1910. He sent 8,000 questionnaires to steel and textile workers. We learned from this that they read Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, the Bible, and crime novels, but they also spoke of their conditions and their hopes. Ich wünsche ein anderes, menschenwürdigeres Leben zu leben, denn dieses Leben unterscheidet sich nicht viel von dem Leben eines Sklaven oder Lasttieres. Und da ich dieses andere Leben nur durch die Erringung der Freiheit bekommen kann, so wünsche ich nichts sehnlicher, als dass man endlich den Kampf für die Freiheit wagt. Und für diesen Kampf wünsche ich mir nur dies eine, lieber Tod als wieder Sklav. But the best intention investigator cannot know everything. It took a young German evangelist preacher, becoming hired as a simple unskilled worker in a large factory, to discover the practices which the historian Alf Lutke called Eigensinn, a sort of worker's aloofness. <laughs> this goes from skiving time at the factory to strange rituals in the workshop. The bucket of icy water over a door. The glue put in shoes. <laughs> The Polish kiss, where a worker spends long minutes rubbing his rough and prickly beard against the cheeks of an unshaven worker. <laughs> a host of saucy tricks and cruel farces, through which the workers' community affirmed its autonomy. Thomas Lindenberger, a historian. Das ist ein Eigensinn der uh sozusagen sehr schwer zu expropriieren ist. Er ist äh, unhintergehbar. Das ist ein bisschen die Idee dabei. Äh, und die Idee dabei ist auch, dass das natürlich Momente sind, die das Leben können in einer solchen Position der Abhängigkeit äh, ermöglicht, ein Stück weit äh, diese Abhängigkeiten erträglich macht. Insofern, äh, Eigensinn ist nicht automatisch identisch mit einer Haltung oder einer Taktik, ich sag mal, des gezielten Widerstands gegen das Herrschaftsverhältnis selbst. Nein, es kann auch äh, die Ermöglichung des Lebens im Herrschaftsverhältnis sein und ist es meistens auch. As an alternative to overthrowing the system, protection from it can be found by creating an interior parallel world, 
run by the workers themselves. Workers' cooperatives began to flourish in Germany, England, and Belgium at the end of the 19th century. At the outset, it was about providing workers with bread at a reasonable price. But the offer quickly spread to all common consumables, to cafes, to theaters, to healthcare. These cooperatives were accused of turning workers away from the fight, but it was also a way of proving that they were capable of running their own lives. The objects on this table are also the product of workers' autonomy. None of them is a car, and yet they were all made in a large automobile factory. With the tools and materials of the factory, by workers from the factory, and on factory time. In France, this sort of side job is best known as perruque ouvrière, literally the worker's wig, a productivist version of Eigensen. Robert Cosmont, a former worker at Renault. Yeah, one of the perruque techniques we have done to plusieurs times, because we don't have the perruque individually, but we have worked as a team, is this little elephant, which is in several pieces of memory, it's 11 pieces, dont la clé pour le fermer, c'est les oreilles. Ce qui était rigolo, c'est que la fraise, ça permet de faire que des coupes à angle droit, et euh, faire un éléphant tout rond avec que des angles droits, c'était un peu rigolo. Voilà, mais c'est au moins 40 heures de boulot. Hein, voilà. Dans cette même partie de l'atelier, il y avait un copain taulier qui a fait une petite brouette en cuivre, et l'intérêt de la brouette, c'est quand même qu'il a fait au marteau le, le rond de la roue, et que c'est pas fait autour, et qu'elle tourne pratiquement sans faux rond. La perruque, ça veut dire le sens de soi, retrouver le sens de soi. Et ça correspond à mon sens, à mon avis, ça correspond vraiment à la réalité de la perruque. C'est-à-dire qu'on travaille pour soi, on retrouve sa personnalité, sa créativité. Ou, ou, ou plus simplement, euh, réparer son scooter, hein, euh, ou euh, réparer une balayette. Euh, mais on travaille pour soi. Moi, je pense qu'il y a une part de révolte, il y a une part de... Euh, de transgression, euh, y compris pour les gens qui ne sont pas militants, qui ne sont pas syndicalistes. Moi, j'ai doublé avec un, sur la scie avec un, vieux, un vieil ouvrier portugais, Pedro euh, da Silva, et il a fait tout, tous les outils chez lui pour construire sa maison, les pelles, les pioches, etc. Il a jamais, je le connaissais bien, parce qu'on travaille ensemble, il n'a jamais voulu faire grève, n'a jamais critiqué euh, l'usine, jamais critiqué les chefs, mais quand il partait avec sa perruque, il avait un sourire jusque-là, parce qu'il parce qu avait transgressé la, la règle. Et la perruque, c'est ambigu, on ne peut pas dire que c'est uniquement de la résistance à l'ordre établi, on ne peut pas dire que c'est seulement euh, de la compromission, parce que euh, ce n'est pas euh, entièrement euh, lutte de classe, une usine, et puis ce n'est pas entièrement... Euh, euh, à, la, à, la, à la botte du patron non plus. Ça dépend des moments, ça dépend des, ça dépend des périodes, ça dépend des jours, ça dépend de le, le, le matin quand tu es euh, en boule ou pas, que tu envoies chier le chef, c'est la vie, quoi. Hein. 